Hello and welcome back to another OpenShift Commons. If you haven't heard, 4.8 is coming out soon and we had the uh, PMs do a what's new in 4.8. Uh, so go back and watch that. But what we're doing now is a deep dive into all the different areas that are new in 4.8. So we're really excited today to have Serena with us, who is the PM for the developer experience of the OpenShift console. So she's going to do a deep dive into what's new in the developer console and OpenShift. And, and from there, we'll get you started with other things that are new in OpenShift 4.8 as well. And Serena, um, do you want to introduce yourself more than I just did? And <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, my name's Serena Nichols, and I'm a product manager in the developer tools BU, and I am uh, specifically working on the developer experience in the OpenShift console and ODO. So thanks for having me here today. And um, I'm going to try to go back and forth between a deck and a demo, but as we know, usually when we do demos, oftentimes we'll, we'll make a, we might encounter some issues, so forgive me if that happens. Um, so I wanted to kind of go through a number. Is, is it all right if I just kick it off, Kalina? Just start exactly. telling? Exactly, that's perfect. Okay, Thank you. perfect. All right. So the first thing I wanted to just introduce is that we have had an ad page redesign. So I'm gonna go into the ad page here. And um, to improve our onboarding, we have a new getting started resources card, which is, which is shown here um for developers on the ad page and it provides resources to create applications using samples um what you can see here so we have a corcus sample and a spring boot sample so people can get up and started quickly to start kicking the tires we also have this area with builded uh, that allows you to build with guided documentation which is referencing our quick starts which we have started um, in 4.6 and continue to improve with each release and then we also have the ability to um, kind of explore some new developer features. So we're showing that there's certified Helm charts um, and as well as having a link to um, some new resources. And you're gonna forgive me because I am on a development cluster. So this is saying 4.9 because I've got a little bit of 4.9 inside of my console that I'm running on right now. Um, so you'll see what's open and uh, what's new in OpenShift 4.8, obviously, when you have 4.8 installed, and that links off to the, the latest and greatest blog ex explaining the newest features. You also have the ability to kind of hide this from your view if you want. So if that's something that you don't want to see, you can do that. And you can also turn these details on and off. So it's just a redesign of that page. Um, and that's kind of what we have there. So the next item that we're gonna show is uh, we'll talk about that we do have new samples available. So if I go back to the ad page and hit the samples item here, we'll see that we've always had this kind of samples uh, catalog, but it used to be predominantly powered by builder images. We now also have this powered by dev files, which are new. Um, and so, for example, we do have a uh, Quarkus sample here that's available. So I can quickly import a dev file, um, uh, which is a Quarkus app, and just hit create. So again, just a way to quickly and easily get a Quarkus app started and, um, and deployed into OpenShift to be able to like kick the tires with that. If you want to learn more about dev files, there is a devfile.io um, site that you should be able to find out the latest and greatest information about that. In addition, we also have a dev file catalog. So if you go to our developer catalog today, we've got a number of different sub catalogs in here. We have builder images, dev files, event sources, home charts, operator back services, and templates. So as I click on dev files, you'll see the four dev files that we do have available here today. These are um, continuing to be created. So you'll see more and more come out through here. Um, but right now we're starting with a basic set of four around Node.js, Python, Quarkus, and Spring Boot. 
please let me know if there's any questions along the way and um, just in, in, you know, jump in, Karina, if there's anything that comes up. The next thing I wanted to show, let's see if we do. Okay, so we don't have um, on this cluster, I don't have the ability to show the, the um, helm charts that are certified, but what I can do show, show here is just the mockups that we do have. So when we have um, helm charts, we're using this icon. It's a blue badge with a white check in it. If that um, icon is shown, that means that it is a certified helm chart. We also, um, so we now do have certified Helm charts coming through and there's a link to Helm certification program announcement here as well, if you want to learn any more about that. Um, in 4.8, the certified Helm charts are becoming available to developers from the catalog. Similarly to operators, that catalog is um, showing a badge for the certified charts. Uh, those charts are also going to get visibility in the Red Hat marketplace. Um, and additional charts will be made available to the catalog, but if you're interested in some specific charts from partners, you can engage um, with partner teams, et cetera, for, for uh, adding more certified charts. Okay, the next piece that, we're, we, that we have done is um, allowed, the, allow the ability to import a multi-doc YAML. So a highly requested feature, which was popular with the CLI users, is finally coming to the console. Users can now um, import multiple YAML files in one go or separate YAML files with dash, dash, dash delimiter and drag and drop that into um, the console. So I'm gonna do an import YAML and I am now going to drag and drop a YAML file. You can see me dropping it here. And as I drop that file, you'll see I have three different areas delimited by the, dash, the, the three dashes. When I hit create, which is, which is something that's very cool, is that it will show me all of the resources that were actually created now. So it gives me the status for all of those, which is very cool. And what that actually did was it, created three console links that are just here immediately under the user menu. But this is gonna be really nice for people instead of having to import files one at a time, they can either drag them in individually, I mean, all at once or have them in a single file to create multiple resources. And the best part too is that you also get the status of all that information. As I continue on, I'm going to talk about easy import for application artifacts. So this is the the, the cool thing we actually um, did focus this on at the April um, summit demo, where we do a drag and drop capability. So if I am in um, topology, and I'm going to create a brand new project, I can spell. You can see what happens is I'm just like in a topology area and it just says I can start building my application or visit the ad page for more details. What I can also do is I do have a jar file, which you probably can't see because I'm just sharing a single browser tab, but um, I am now dragging and dropping this um, jar file into or onto my topology view. And when I drop that, it brings up a form that says, do you want to upload your JAR file? Gives a whole bunch of um, defaults for me. I can provide a lot more information if I'd like. I'm actually not going to deploy, I'm going to deploy this, but I'm not going to give all the, I'm not going to uh, run the application. So I'm just going to hit create by default right now. What you'll see is a JAR file, JAR file uploading um, alert notification and tells me that I can access the build logs if I want to. I can kind of go over there, check out what's going on. It does take a little bit because it is uploading that jar file and then it's going to do a build. But it's a really quick and easy way for somebody to actually come in and take a local jar file that they've been developing on their local desktop and be able to deploy it into OpenShift by just drag and drop. So this is something that we're pretty excited about. And I've talked about, you know, how do we bring this forward going forward? Do we want to do the same thing with home chart archives? Etc. So it's it's a 
a nice new feature for devs to get up and running really quickly. And we can see that that build is continuing to run. So I'm just going to, um, I'm going to continue to go to the next piece to demo. The next one is around improved search in our catalog and in our topology. So I'm just trying to call out where these areas are in the different views. So if I go to the topology view, um, there is an icon here. We added this feature a couple of releases ago. I think we added it in 4.6, but um, not everybody's aware of it. So I'm going to demo this again just really quickly. If I click on that, what it does is it allows me to do a quick search of not only the developer catalog, but the sample catalog and the quick start catalog. So what we've done here to improve the search capability is that rather than searching for an entire string, we're kind of matching substrings. So if I wanted to type in Quarkus, I can see, okay, I got four matches for Quarkus, but if I just wanna see a Quarkus quick start, I can start typing that. So it's actually taking matches from the description, from the title, as well as that subtype, that subcatalog type, which is nice. Um, that was something that we weren't able to do previously. And I'll give you another example. So uh, this is the one I always used to do is uh, Postgres and then Ephemeral. It, I, now that they're doing like two substring matches, you're able to easily put thing, two, two different items together and um, able to see that powerful search match. So we have that capability here inside of the topology search but we also have it inside of our developer catalog. If I go back over here and press and then ephemeral, we see that that also works the same way in the developer catalog. So again, just a more powerful search that will hopefully allow users to find things much faster than they had previously. The next piece is uh, another one of our items, which is parity with 3.x. So I think a lot of people um, who have been users of OpenShift through the 3.x timeframe, we did have quite a few form-based experiences in 3.x, which we have not completely finished um, providing parity for in 4.x. So the good news is in 4.8, we will have a form-based edit for deployments and deployment configs. So if I go back into my topology view, and let me just go, I think I have one in here. Um, I do, so I can click on this deployment and you can see either in my actions menu here, I have an edit deployment, or I could do a right click, which brings up edit deployment. And this brings me to a form, which is awesome. So this would be enable me to quickly come down here, change any of the basic options for deployment strategy, et cetera, but also lets me access some of those advanced options like pause rollouts and scaling. So it allows me to do this through um, my form view instead of doing YAML view. And of course, if people do prefer YAML editing, they can still go over to the YAML view and do that. Um, but our default is the form view. I know that was a frequently asked request from customers, so that should definitely make a lot of people happy <laughs> who are coming over from 3.x. Okay, um, the next item that I was gonna go over is around um, expanded UI for serverless. So when the serverless operator is installed, we continue to enhance the console and we've made progress in three main areas. The first one is that we're, we have provided a new tech preview command, which is called make serverless. And it creates a new serverless deployment next to your existing deployment. Other configurations, including the traffic pattern can also be modified in the form. So what I'm gonna do here is this, and this is around, oops, sorry. This is again around, um, the ability to take an existing application and convert it to serverless. Now, the reason we're calling it Tech Preview is because at this moment, um, it was our first round of, of this capability, but also right now what we're doing is we're just leaving um, 
that initial deployment. And so if I click on, on that deployment, like I've showed before, you can either get it to the actions menu on the right hand side, or you can get it through right click here. If I click on make serverless, it brings up a form. Note it does show tech preview. Um, it gives me all kinds of information and defaults that are provided. And then also it does allow me to do some additional advanced options. I'm gonna take everything as the default here and I'm gonna hit create. And what you see is that key native service is being created in that same application as my initial deployment was. Um, this thing is still now running. The build is complete. There we go. And the revision has now shown up. So I should hypothetically, if I click on this um, route, I should also be able to access the serverless application from here. Yeah, so it's available and ready. So it's a really nice tool to start um, migrating your regular applications and trying to see what that would look like if it was deployed as a serverless application. I'm going to go on to the next item, which is around uh, still st sticking with the serverless. We do now have cloud function support in topology. So I'm going to go back into the topology view and go into. Sorry, I just have to find the correct project. There we go. So. Um, just to give an example of what things look like, uh, this item here on the right hand side is a Knative service. So as you can see, the logo on the bottom left hand side is the Knative logo. Um, you'll see that that KSVC, that's indicating that it's a of type Knative service. And what we do is we have a bounding box around the all of the revisions that are in the active traffic block. So in this case, this Knative service has a single revision, 100% of the traffic is coming here. What we're doing for our cloud functions is something very similar. Um, interesting, looks like I just hit a little bug there with that tooltip, sorry about that. Um, so, but what we see here is this bounding box, if it's a cloud function, the bounding box has a purple, light purple or lavender background. Um, but this really is a Knative service underneath, so we still have that resource badge that says KSVC, but what we're showing is a badge for showing that it's a cloud function. Um, so that's the way to differentiate between a cloud function and a Knative service. The other kind of cool thing that we do have is we do have the ability to um, provide, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a cloud function can be a sync of an event source. So as I hovered over there, I saw a blue um, arrow that I'm just gonna kind of drag and drop onto the canvas. As I do that, I see that I have an event source option that's available. So I'm gonna click on event source and I'm going to choose the ping source here. What this allows me to do is um, create an event source that will kind of, um, here's the data that would go that's gonna get posted to the target function. I'm gonna have this run, I think it's every minute. By default, it's already um, providing a sync to that event display function. Uh, and I'll hit create. And what we, sh what we should see is every minute, we'll see this cloud function kind of wake up from the ping source, there we go. And um, if we go into the logs of this, we'll, we'll actually see the data coming in. So let's see if I can successfully get there. I click here, go to the log. There's the cloud event. And I'm not sure if I'm getting to get the right. Uh, Maybe one of those spots where I'm not going to get what I'm looking for, but we'll see. I think we should be getting this is the data here. And if I don't get it this time, we might just move on to the next. We are seeing the cloud event showing um, and that it's associated with the ping source. There's the next invocation 
So we are getting the information. So again, it's although we can't create cloud functions inside of the developer console through the UI yet, anything that's created in the back end or if that exists inside of the project or if you utilize the uh, CLI, we're able to visualize it. So good to go there. The next item is just around, we also did provide some additional scaling options for Knative services. So again, if I go back into the topology view, and let's just say I was going to um, deploy an image, and I would say I'm going to make this resource not a deployment, not a deployment config, but a key native service. As I do that, the advanced options update, and um, if I go to scaling, what you'll see here, and I'm going to just increase the text here a little bit so it's a little easier for people to read. We do now have the ability for to specify the con concurrency utilization, um, which allows users to set the percentage of concurrent requests before scaling up. And then also the other new one is that we're supporting is the auto scale window, which again allows users to set the duration to look back for marking auto scaling decisions. That service ends up getting scaled to zero if no, no requests are received in that time period. So two very useful um, scaling options that we've now made available for our serverless apps. Okay, now I'm gonna move to OpenShift pipelines. Um, here. I'm going to find a pipeline application. Let's see, I'm going to have to do a search real quickly because I forget which project I have this in. So uh, give me one second. I do a search for all the pipelines and said, okay, here we go. So here is, it was in my, my test. Okay, great. So I'm going to go back into the developer console. I'm in my test and I'm going to go into the pipelines area. And what I'll see is that I do have, um, sorry, I have to go into my test. Here we go. Here we go. So I have a pipeline that's living here now. And what we'll see in, with the pipelines information is that we're now in, in along with 4.8, let's see, along with 4.8, OpenShift Pipelines 1.5 is going to GA. So what we'll see here is that we have in, in the console, we've introduced feature parity with Tekton within the pipeline builder, as well as other pipeline related flows. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the information around when expressions and finally tasks. So um, somebody was nice enough to provide a pipeline for me here, which does show the when expressions and finally tasks. So this um, diamond shaped is representing a when expression. So right now I'm looking at the pipeline definition, right? So there's no status associated with this. So this is showing that there's when expressions for each one of these tasks. And then this, this larger white um, area, rectangular -ish area is representing the different finally tasks, which are available or specified as part as, of this pipeline. If I just run this pipeline, what we'll see is it will bring me automatically to the pipeline run and saying that it's executed. What we'll see here is um, the one expression that's currently being run is shown in the dark blue. So we'll see that create file, which is a task, is now being run. Um, and if I hover over that create file task, you'll see that the step called the write new stuff is um, there and being executed. And as we continue uh, waiting here for a couple of minutes, we'll see a lot of these, the different tasks inside that pipeline run being run and we'll see what happens. So for example, um, if it's gray, if that one expression, that diamond is gray, that means that the expression was not met. So that task will not be um, implemented, or I'm sorry, will not be run. If it's green, that means that the one expression was met and that that task was then executed. 
So you can see here, there were um, two one expressions that are actually three that are green. So three that were met and actually the tasks were um, executed. And then there were a number uh, that remained gray that were not met. So those tasks were not executed. So um, it's nice to see that that we now do have feature parity with the Tecton CLI and that we have this capability now inside of pipelines so that you can see the status uh, when your pipeline has either a when expression or a finally task. What I'm also going to do is just go into the pipeline builder quickly and if I hit create pipeline, I can get there two ways by the way. I can either go to the pipelines area and hit create pipeline or I could go to the add page and I could hit pipelines here. I'm gonna reset my font because um, I enlarged it earlier. So I'm gonna hit pip pipelines. I'm gonna go to the pipeline builder area and you can see here now, this is my pipeline visualization. And you can see I have the ability to add a finally task here immediately if I wanted to. <clears throat> I also have the ability to add a task just like we had previously. So I'm just going to add something. This is not gonna be a pipeline that makes sense, but I just wanna be able to show you guys a couple of things. So as I add a task, um, we see that red exclamation point up on the top left-hand corner, which is referencing the fact that there is something missing for my task. So you can see here, I need a source or I need an input works, uh, workspaces available. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's why that red exclamation point is showing. But if I wanted to add a when expression, this is where I would do that, okay? I would be able to add that when expression here. And then you can see that diamond shape is showing up. I'm not gonna add that information here, but I just wanted to show how you could do it. The other thing um, is when you add a finally tasks, this again is the same list of tasks you have available. It just means that Anything that's in the finally task section will get run automatically regardless of um, the status of those previous tasks that are not in the finally task section. That might be something that you might use for cleanup or something like that in your uh, pipeline. Okay, so those are the main areas in pipeline and pipeline builder where we had, we, we had talked about both the when expressions and the finally tasks. This piece I don't, I'm not able to demo today, but I did wanna just show you in our cluster today, we do have, um, if the GitOps operator is installed, we have an environments page. Oh, actually, there we go. We do have um, one application, which has kind of been bootstrapped by Cam so that it shows up inside of our um, console. This is, um, Right now, I don't have the latest version of GitOps installed. So what um, my screenshot that's inside of this deck is even is a little bit better, where it shows not only will it show the application name as well as the Git repository, but it will also show you how many environments that application is been deployed to. So in this case, it just shows, um, I'm sorry, it shows one and it, when I hover over the one, it shows me that the dev environment is synced and that's in sync with the status that we're getting from Argo. And it also shows you that last deployment. So again, this nice this improved visualization will be available when we have GitOps 1.2 GA on OCP 4.8 or any flavor of OpenShift. Um, and our environment, like as it says, our environments view in the console provides insight into the app life cycle. Um, we do also have the ab ability to kind of drill into one of these applications. And in 4.8, this remains unchanged, but this is in 4.9, you're going to see some additional um, improvements to this view as well. But this is showing you, okay, my application called App Taxi is running on my dev environment. If I wanted to, I could link out to Argo CD to get more information and be able to do some additional use cases. Um, but it's showing me that I have a single deployment called Taxi, that, that, um, that we do have that application running. There's a pod that's actually running there. Uh, and in this case, the commit details are not available. 
but this whole page here, you'll see some significant improvements in the 4.9 timeframe as well. So pipelines and um, GitOps in that entire kind of outer loop experience is, is a, an area where we're putting um, a lot of effort and improvements in, in the coming, you know, we have been as well, but we're going to continue to do that in the upcoming year. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in from where we were just talking about how the developer can do everything and what they can access. Now I'm going to talk about customizing the developer experience. So as an administrator, how you might want to customize the experience for your developers to make them um, more productive or more efficient, those type of things. So what you'll see here actually is kind of exciting in my opinion always is that these, you know, these three have actually come from customer requirements or I'm sorry, customer feature requests. Um, you know, with each release, we try to put in new features with new technologies, but we're also always trying to um, to, to kind of guide that and, and juggle that along with some improvements and usability improvements as well as customer requests. So this is an exciting piece for me to, to be able to share back with customers and users who are trying to communicate with us what they want. That it's showing that we are trying to, to give them some of that information as well. So this is talking about some of the new quick start features that we have. Um, what I'm going to do here is I, I think everybody does probably has some awareness of what quick starts are, but for if you don't, I'm going to go to the help menu um, on, the, on the masthead and click on the quick starts menu item. That shows me all of our quick starts that we have available inside of the console today. Um, what's interesting about quick starts is they are customizable so any administrator or actually any operator can create their own quick starts and make them available um, to anybody using the platform what's really nice and what we've heard from our customers is that um, one of the exciting pieces about that about this is that they can create their own quick starts to help jumpstart their own developers or their own um, development teams uh, to provide them some, with some additional information on um, what their, you know, like what their standards might be or their best practices might be, for example. Um, we can see here, we have some here that are talking about like adding health checks to your sample applications and things like that. But you could really, as an admin or even, um, a, a team, a, a development lead, right? You could want to create some quick starts to help kind of jumpstart or uh, onboard some of your development team. Um, and, it's, and it's a pretty easy process. We've got a bunch of samples that are available. But what I really wanted to talk about today is that we do have um, a new type of support inside of our quick starts, which is, um, integrated with our web terminal operator. So again, for people, if you don't know about the web terminal operator, definitely check it out. If you're an admin in the operator hub, we do have this web terminal operator when that is installed. What you'll see is you'll see that um, the icon up here on the top um, masthead. When I click on that, it takes a second. It's going to create a workspace for me. So it is going to um, takes a second to connect to my terminal for me. Um, but as I, once I do that, I do have the ability to to utilize command line um, command lines as as much as possible, you know, as much as I want, and it's inside of um, my web browser. So why is this a nice feature for developers? It's all enclosed in a single browser. But not only that, if you happen to be in an environment where you're not allowed to install CLIs on your own machine, this gives you the ability to run the CLIs from inside of this command line terminal, right? So um, it's a really nice, uh, if, if you're kind of locked it, locked down and not, don't have that capability of doing the installation on your, on your own desktops, you have the ability to, do, to access them here. So it's nice. Now, if I go back to my quick start, um, what I wanted to show you guys was the fact that we do have the ability to now have quick starts, have, um, the ability to do a copy to a clipboard or more importantly, to rub in a, uh, to run in a web terminal. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to show you is just one of, uh, this is a sample uh, quick start. 
And what this does is um, it's just going to create a project, right? So here's the CLI command, OC New Project Sample Test App, right? This is very simple, but just for um, just showing the example, I can either copy it to my clipboard if I want, or I can run it in the web terminal. If by chance you don't have the web terminal installed, you'll only be able to copy it to your clipboard. But since I have web terminal installed, if I click that play icon, um, as soon as I click that, you'll see that here we go, it's executed the, the um, command. And if I now go back into OpenShift, I'm gonna go to my topology view and see if there's a, um, I'm sorry, a project called sample test app. So, yep, here we go. There's a, there's a project called that, um, nothing's in it yet. So now in the next step, what they're talking about is they're going to create a resource using this code, this Git repo. Um, so the next command will be to deploy an app, OC new app. Again, if I click this and say run in the web terminal, what we hope to see is a deployment show up inside of our topology view. Now we see the command is executed, perfect. We see the deployment is being created. Right now, if we hover over that bottom left hand decorator as we call it we see that that build is running so <clears throat> what we could i'm going to i'm just going to close this nav so we have a little bit more space and if i click on this i think we'll also see the side pan oh no we're going to go directly to the build details sorry let me go back over here i'm sorry i'll click on the deployment itself and we will see that the build is running so there's another panel here so now so just note on this, the fur furthest right hand panel that we're seeing now is this is the quick start panel. Um, this panel on the bottom is our command line terminal panel. And then we also have the side panel for topology. So if I wanted to go look at the logs of my build, I could either click here or I could have clicked directly there, but now our build is complete. So we should see our pod spinning up. If I hover over this, we'll see, yep, there's one's pod pending. And hopefully in a second that turns dark blue, great. But now what we notice is there's no route for this resource. So it's no easy way for me to run this, this deployment. So now I'm gonna go back over to my quick start and it says expose the route by clicking this. And as I do that, you'll see down here, the route is, is shown automatically in the side panel. And then we see on the top right-hand quadrant, we have our route decorator. Um, and it shows that I can, it, it, it's indicating that if I click on that, it will open the URL for that app. And there we go, there's our, our application. So pretty cool. It does give you the ability to have a quick start that does um, directions or gives you instruction for both um, different use cases or user flows through the UI itself and or utilize something that even the one, another example that this might be really helpful for is when the console might not support everything 100%, you might be able to do something through a CLI that um, is not available and, and a quick start could help with that capability. I'm gonna leave this quick start now and I am Cube Admin. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to my nav back, go into the search section, and just go to the console quick starts because this is what powers all of our quick starts. They are CRs. And if I create a console quick start by default, they do provide a kind of a, a default quick start that's available. Um, But what I'm going to do, let's see, I thought there were supposed to be, yeah, so I apologize. There are supposed to be uh, some snippets here, which there are in 4.8 for some reason. My cluster's not showing them. Um, so let me just go back directly into the example. The, sorry, I'm trying to remember what it was called. <laughs> um, there it is, hey demo, there we go. This is the one that is showing the syntax for copy and paste. So in this case, if you wanted to um, 
show the copy or the execute pieces inside of the quick start. The syntax is just kind of right here. And I also have this in the deck that I'll show again. It's just pretty easy where you utilize the copy or the execute command. Um, once we do, we do typically have the sidebar that has snippets and we will have a snippet that puts this information in there for you into your YAML file. So it's pretty easy. Um, but I'm gonna switch back over to my deck, which shows what the format is for the copy, as well as what the format is for the execute. And if you put the execute command in, like I mentioned, it will provide icons for both copy and execute. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Um, the next piece is around the fact that there's more ways to customize the developer experience by hiding individual features from the ad page. So we just kind of mentioned earlier at the beginning of this that we do have this um, redesigned kind of ad page here. Um, and what we have heard from customers is sometimes they might not want all of these features available for their development team. So I'm going to try um, to do this and we, we'll see, hopefully I don't fail. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is remove the from Docker file piece um, from the ad setup. So I'm gonna have to cheat over here and go look and see what I need to do. So I'm gonna go to my, See, I have to go over to search, find console. I'm really hoping I'm doing the right one. Go into cluster, go to YAML. I can view my sidebar. I can go down to the spec area and view details here. And no, I think I went to the wrong one. See, I knew I was going to do this. <laughs> one sec. Search. Might be this one. Sorry. See if I get the right one here. Yes, this is the right one. Okay. So let's just go back there to make sure I explain. There are two. Um, there are two console resources. We want the one that's the operator.openshift.io. So if I click on that and then go into that resource, go to the YAML file and I view the sidebar, the cool thing about this is it does allow me to see the spec. So if I click view details of the spec, it shows me that there's customization available and I can view details of that customization. And this is showing me that I can modify the ad page and it even provides, you know, the, the ability if I drill in a little bit more, it tells me that I can provide disabled actions here. So let's see if I can um, do this. So, uh, whoops, I need to do customization ad page disabled actions. So let's see. Um, all right, the other neat thing about this is it does have snippets. So it's telling me that it does have ad page actions and I can insert a snippet. So let's see if I can get this to work properly. I can open this up in CEML. Oh, but this is gonna give me every different. So what this is showing you is all of the different keywords that you need to hide the different pieces. So for one second, I'm just going to share my move my screen over so I can type this. See again if this works. Um, underneath stuck, what I'm going to do is add customization. I'm really making myself nervous here. I'm going to say add page. I'm going to say disabled actions colon, and then I'm going to say hyphen space import from Docker file. And I'm gonna copy this just in case for some reason I have to do a reload and hit save. Okay, now let's go back over to the ad page. Whoops, and do a refresh. It does take a couple seconds if I've done it right. Um, <laughs> and maybe I haven't. There we go. Phew. 
successfully. Um, so import from Docker file is now um, not available anymore uh, on this cluster for, for anybody to have access to. So again, that's, you know, as we just kind of went through this, um, if I go back over to the view sidebar and look at the snippets, for somebody who wants to kind of set the access to, to hide some of those items, that is where you could see it, right? So disables upload jar, pipeline, operator back services, there's a number of things here that you can disable. And now, oops, one more thing here is we've got one more way to customize the developer experience, which has been added in um, for eight. So I'm going to show you another, another kind of fun area inside of the developer perspective is when you go to a project. So I have my project selected. I go to the project item in the nav area. I've got three tabs here. If I go to project access, this is something that was added a number of releases ago based on some extensive work, um, collaborative work we were doing with one of our customers and they were like, oh, it would be really nice if for a developer, if they could just say, I want to share my project with somebody easily rather than having to go into the admin side and fool around with role bindings, et cetera. Is there an easy way we could do that? So what we had initially done was we created this project access page. This allows you to, you know, add access super quickly. But what we did was we initially just said you could either have admin, edit, or view rights. Well, so good news is customers are, or people are using this, which is awesome. But now they wanted to have the ability to um, customize this role list of roles. So if they have their own custom roles, they want to be able to update those here so that a developer will be able to utilize one of those custom roles that the admin has provided. So let's see if we can do this again. I'm going to go back right over to it's going to it's by editing the same console resource. So let's see if I can do this right this time. Um, I go find that console resource. I go into cluster. I go to YAML, go to my sidebar and Go into spec customization and I will see here, let's see, project access. So project access allows customizing the available list of cluster roles, da, da, da. You can view the details. So that's going to be the context I need to have now. It's project access and then available cluster roles. And if I look at snippets, I think we also have some information here. We do. So available cluster roles, and then you would just add whatever you want. Um, for your example. So let's see, what did I have here? Registry admin. So I'm going to try that again here. So we already have a single customization, which was add page. Going to try to make this larger. So, oops, so it's a little easier for people to see. Except I lost my spot. There we go. Um, and now let's see what I need to do here is project access. I think. Let's go back to my notes. Yeah, project access and then available cluster roles. Available cluster roles. And then I'm just going to type in admin, um, edit, view, and registry admin. Okay. And I'm going to copy it just in case. Hit a save. So there I am. I reset my spacing and my magnification. Go back to the developer perspective. Go back to my project. Go back to project access. Let's hit refresh again. I think it take. I think there is a little bit of a timer here. It may be a minute. I see though that now these are lowercase, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there we go. So now we do have registry admin is now available. Um, so again, super easy way for um, an administrator by utilizing the YAML editor 
to kind of customize these couple of different areas inside of the developer experience. So this is, you know, this is pretty exciting stuff um, to make the devs life easier. So with that, I know we probably still have about eight or nine minutes left, but I did want to um, just kind of open it up if there's questions or comments. Also, just so you guys do know, there is a link on developers.redhat.com now um, that we do have a what's new link and that will point to the latest what's new blog for the latest release. And that's going to, again, be focused on um, the developer use cases and, you know, what's new and maybe point out to other blogs or other re references as well. And um, also just going to mention my Twitter handle is Serena Marie 125. If anybody ever has feedback, complaints, happiness, any of that wants to connect on possible feature requests or, you know, you might see something wrong or, or any type of comment, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a product manager on the dev experience side of the console and am always looking for any type of feedback. So with that, I will pass back to Karina and see if we've got um, anything else to talk about. Thank you so much. I am really excited about all the new features that you were able to get into 4.8, uh, especially the CLI, the web console CLI. I think that's my favorite. Um, yeah. What, what is your favorite that you were able to get into 4.8 that the engineering teams were able to? I, well, I think the most exciting one seemed to be the drag and drop for the jar, of the jar file. It seemed to get a lot of excitement, I think. Um, so I think that was like, I, it's kind of, I don't know, it, it, it kind of, it's a similarity to YouTube of just being able to drag and drop things in and quickly deploy though for us, right? So that was awesome. Um, I would say the other pieces that we did not talk about today is the managed Kafka um, capabilities. And unfortunately, I just didn't have a setup to show that, but that's also an awful large part of what we've been um, working on for the, the previous quarter. Um, so there's a lot of excitement there around being able to have Red, Red Hat managed Kafka and be able to utilize that from inside the console. And I apologize because my dogs just ran in. <laughs> So if you hear noise in the background, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll definitely have the, uh, a talk on the managed Kafka service um, up coming soon as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to that um, and getting people's feedback on that. That'll be great. Um, we also have a number of other deep dives that are coming as well um, on the, the, this current release. Um, so please uh, stay tuned for that. I'll, I'll throw up the, the link. Yeah, there you go. Um, to all the upcoming ones as well. Um, July is going to be um, fortune hot with new release updates. Yeah, they all look great. Um, okay. I'm especially excited for Mark Curry's. I don't know. I'm a huge fan of Mark and all his networking, everything he's able to get into OpenShift for networking. And of course, serverless. We had Nana on before talking about serverless functions. So that'll be a great update. Um, and of course, pipeline. All right, I like them all. What can I say? Lots of good stuff going on, for sure. We're all, if I we're can all give one biased. More... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I also want to give, can I give one more plug? Oh, please, definitely. Okay, so in the near future, so we, we are moving towards dynamic plugins for our, um, for our UI, which means an operator can provide their own uh, UI to be installed when the operator is being installed. So right now what we do is any extensions we have to their console, they live in the console code base. The really cool thing about dynamic plugins is that once we have this available early part of next year, we're gonna have a pilot program for allowing customers to also, or, or other users to customize their own, um, their own console. So, you know, stay tuned if those are things that you're interested in, stay tuned or connect with myself or Ali Moverm is the PM on the admin side who's, we're both working on this. So it's a pretty exciting piece um, for both our operator story as well as uh, for users. Thanks for that. All right. 
kudos on the terminal CLI feature also. Thanks, Shana. Great, and thank you so much for joining us and showing us everything that's new in the 4.8 console for developers. And again, reach out to Serena on Twitter. I know she's quite active there. And thank you everyone. And be sure to join us for next time when we talk about pipelines, what's new in pipelines and GitOps in 4.8. So thank you everyone. And Chris, can you see us out?